us to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, America deserves an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Over two years into an economic recovery, America's labor and capital markets continue to face unprecedented challenges. Nearly four, 14 million Americans remain officially unemployed, an additional 11 million underemployed, and small businesses continue to struggle to access capital, despite endless numbers of government initiatives. Fixing our capital markets and economy will not occur overnight, will, nor will it be achieved with more government regulation. Today's oversight hearing serves as part two in our capital formation series, examining government barriers to small business capital formation and growth. The origin of these barriers to capital formation re rest in two major federal securities laws, the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 that have not been substantially updated since a gallon of gasoline cost 10 cents, 31% of American households had a telephone, and the national debt was just $22.5 billion. Today, gas prices are 35 times that per gallon, and nearly every American owns a phone. In fact, most households have access to the internet in their pockets. And the national debt, well, that's maybe for a different hearing. Uh, while the comparison of then and now is nostalgic, the ramifications of not modernizing our securities regulations have led to registration and requ uh, reporting requirements so onerous and costly that small companies have great difficulty raising capital. For instance, if a startup company offers an equity stake to investors through a medium like Facebook or Twitter, it is presumably in violation of SEC regulations for such communication and offerings. However, soliciting money uh, for one's favorite charity or political candidate is perfectly legal using the internet medium, and uh, that is clear, clearly saying that something is wrong. Um, this is, you know, when, when politics exceeds where, where business is, uh, there's something wrong culturally with that. Since September, when this subcommittee had its first hearing to address barriers to capital formation, the House Financial Service Committee approved four pieces of legislation with bipartisan support that will modernize SEC regulations to promote, rather than hinder, small business access to capital financing. The full House is expected to vote on all four of these this week. The Small Company Capital Formation Act of 2011, sponsored by Congressman Schweikert of Arizona, would authorize the SEC to exempt from registration any class of securities so long as the 12-month 12 12 aggregate offering does not exceed $50 million. Congressman Himes of Connecticut sponsored legislation to raise the bank shareholder threshold for SEC reg registration from 500 to 2,000. The SEC has neglected to update this threshold for nearly 50 years. The Access to Capital for Job Creators Act, sponsored by Congressman McCarthy of uh, uh, California, removes a regulatory ban that prevents small, privately held companies from using advertisements to solicit investors. And lastly, my legislation, the Entrepreneur Access to Capital Act, which I introduced uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, removes SEC restrictions on crowdfunding to allow entrepreneurs to raise capital from everyday investors. This legislation simply extends the same characteristics of, of crowdsourcing or crowdfunding today that is limited to the realm of charities and the arts through online communication and social networking. Uh, this would allow small businesses and innovators to raise capital. Already, uh, this is prevalent in Europe and Asia uh, and has proven that uh, broadening uh, communication and investment capabilities between investors and entrepreneurs can have a positive impact on capital formation, the lifeblood of our economy. 
Each of these bills strengthens the mission of the SEC to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. Federal and state regulators remain empowered to fight deceit, misrepresentation, and other fraud in the sale of securities. This is an important piece. This key mandate for investor protection in each capital formation bill is why all four drew uh, broad bipartisan support from members of Congress on both sides of the aisle and marketplace participants. While the bills approved by the House Financial Services Committee uh, serve as a solid first step, there is more to do. That's what this hearing is about today. I look forward to the SEC to complete its review of regulatory burdens on small business capital formation, which they've pledged to do, including the exemption of accredited investors and employees from outdated 500 shareholder uh, cap limitations. Uh, today's witnesses serve as real life examples of businesses that, uh, that face barriers when raising capital and would benefit from simple modern updates to SEC regulations. I'm interested to hear what each of you have to, to say about the various bills before Congress and the additional ideas that you have uh, for businesses that face uh, this challenge of raising capital and the immediate effects that it would have from responsible securities laws um, and what the SEC can do to protect investors and increase access to capital. Uh, this was a very important note in order for us to uh, reduce this unemployment rate and get people working again. Uh, and with that, I recognize Mr. Quigley of Illinois, the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing uh, and for your recent bipartisan work to spur capital formation for startup businesses through crowdfunding legislation. I thank our witnesses for being here today. Um, we recognize that the number one prior of this Congress has got to be lowering the 9% unemployment rate. But for businesses to expand and hire new and workers, they need capital. A July 2010 report by the Chamber of Commerce states, clearly any strategy to jumpstart the economy must have a robust small business component that allows entrepreneurs to access capital and retain existing cash flow from operations in order to start, grow, and expand their enterprises. That is why I am pleased to see that both President Obama and Chairman McHenry have found common ground on the idea of crowdfunding. To the extent that crowdfunding can match ready capital with quality investment opportunities, it will be a success. The question should not be whether to allow crowdfunding, but under what terms it should move forward and what other ideas we should consider. After exploring crowdfunding with the help of expert testimony our September 5th hearing, I am encouraged that many of the potential problems with crowdfunding were addressed when the Chairman's legislation was taken up by the Financial Services Committee. Still, some issues remain. For example, there are legitimate concerns that exempting crowdfunding from securities regulation would open or expand opportunities for fraud. Just as water standards keep our water safe to drink, financial regulations protect us against unsafe financial products. Crowdfunding might also expose ordinary investors to a level of risk that is unacceptable when not accompanied by standard registration and disclosure. We have to be careful to ensure that investors fully understand the risk of investing in these financial products. There is also the issue of state preemption. We have to carefully consider what role state securities administrators should play in managing fraud concerns and maintaining the integrity of the securities market. Finally, although I think it is a it's wonderful that we are exploring crowdfunding as one way to encourage business innovation in this country. An important point to remember is that crowdfunding is not a panacea for the state of the U.S. economy, <coughs> excuse me, job growth, or even the capital needs of small and startup businesses. The challenges facing small businesses and entrepreneurs in the United States are varied, and so too should be our strategy. For example, Ms. Williams, as I understand it, will testify about how her business's initial achievements were made possible through small government-sponsored grant programs such as the Small Business Innovation Research Program. I hope that all of our witnesses can touch on how a multi-pronged approach to capital formation can reach the most potential entrepreneurs. I also hope that <coughs> they can help us explore how the strategies that the President laid out in his Jobs Act will help small businesses and entrepreneurs overcome some of the obstacles they are facing and spur American innovation. I thank the Chairman again for calling this timely hearing, and I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. Uh, and um, 
Members uh, have seven days to submit uh, opening statements for the record, and we'll now recognize the panel. Uh, our first uh, panelist today is uh, Mr. Eric Koester, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer and co-founder of Zarly, um, which, is on, uh, which is a website. Um, uh, and uh, Ms. Uh, Lana Williams is the Chief Executive Officer of Ridge Diagnostics. And Dr. Svi Goldenberg is the Chief Executive Officer of EMRA, if I said that correctly. Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg. Um, and uh, I ask unanimous consent that uh, the, the panel may each have six minutes for their opening comments um, without objection. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Koester. Um, and if you could just uh, summarize your opening statement, you have six minutes, and uh, then we'll uh, have uh, plenty of time for questions. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quickly, and the members of the committee. My name is Eric Custer, and I'm one of the co-founders and the Chief Operating Officer of Zarly, a real-time online commerce marketplace. Zarly represents an early success story of our innovation economy. Having been formed just this past March, launched the product in May, added over 100,000 users in just this past summer, and hired 30 employees with the hopes of hiring more. This past month, we were able to announce that we'd raised venture capital funding, and we're fortunate to add Meg Whitman to our board, who we hope can help us take this product from early adoption to mass scale. I hope to provide a, a bit of a unique vantage point to the challenges faced by entrepreneurs because of my background. During my career as an attorney specializing in advising entrepreneurs, small businesses, and startups, I was able to work with hundreds of entrepreneurs across dozens of industries. Then I too followed the allure of the American dream and, and left the practice of law to launch my own company, Zarly. As a result of these experiences, I think I do have an insight into the, the challenges faced by today's entrepreneurs. So today my testimony will focus on three key areas. Number one, what are the key challenges broadly faced by today's entrepreneurs? Number two, an examination of the, the broad landscape that's facing today's entrepreneurs and small business owners. And finally, how some enhancements to today's regulatory scheme can help aid entrepreneurs. So the first question is, what are the overall key challenges faced by some entrepreneurs today? Well, I think the important one faced by, uh, discussed by this committee today has to do with fundraising and opportunities to get access to capital. The second one is really an access to talent. Uh, Zarly itself has hired 30 new employees just this past year, and if I had the opportunity to hire 10 more qualified engineers, I certainly would. I think this can be addressed in a number of different ways, but I do think that looking at opportunities for immigration reform and continuing to invest in education, sciences, and more innovation opportunities will help that. The third opportunity and challenge faced by small businesses and entrepreneurs is streamlining the paperwork, the formation, and the regulatory scheme that we face. The fourth is an open and free internet, cell phone, and data opportunity and access to those resources. And finally, I think the largest challenge that we all on, as entrepreneurs face is the general challenges of operating a business, getting more customers and making them love our products. So starting a business is obviously never easy. There's thousands of ways for businesses to misstep from team dynamics to market forces and to the inability to find financing. The reforms being discussed by the committee are not necessarily will make starting or expanding a business any easier. There's still thousands of ways for businesses to misstep and thousands of ways for businesses to fail. However, the reason that these reforms are important are that they do allow another opportunity for businesses to expand and potentially succeed, to find new sources of capital, to raise additional cushion to hire more employees, or to provide an additional runway for the business model to be expanded. And by providing these additional avenues in, to access to funds, this is the opportunity that I think businesses will now have to expand and grow. So secondly, what are the key challenges faced by entrepreneurs and business founders today that are different than the days when, as Chairman McHenry noted, gas was 35 cents a gallon? Well, I think my time advising entrepreneurs and small business owners has been important in noting my views. And just as important, I've been fortunate to learn firsthand in the founding of Zarly what some of those challenges are. The first lesson about today's landscape is that starting a business is now cheaper than ever before. Although there is not 
an easy way to start a business without access to some capital. Today, businesses, with the help of technology, have been able to, to be started for as little as $5,000 and expanded in the, for the tens of thousands of dollars. And while technology has been able to reduce these costs for things such as bookkeeping, advertising, data storage, and equipment rental, today's technology businesses and other businesses still do require te technology and capital to expand those businesses and exceed beyond that early proving point. The second challenge in, in, uh, in expansion in the, uh, the opportunity for businesses today is the explosion of the freelance economy. Today, one of every 10 workers for companies is not an employee of the company they work for. These individuals are independent contractors, freelancers, and individual entrepreneurs that can help these businesses be more effective and efficient. And this trend is only expected to continue with careers such as graphics design, software developer, photography, writers, and artists all expected to see their ranks grow by as much as 10% in the next 10 years. These individuals, though, are entrepreneurs and small business owners who do require access to capital to grow and expand as our economy needs them more and more. The next new change in the landscape has been the emergence of international competition that affects businesses even earlier and earlier. Two examples of the innovation economy, Groupon and Living Social, have seen international copycats pop up in as few as months after they had launched their businesses, leading businesses such as Zarli and those on the panel today to need to launch faster, quicker, and gain access to capital soon. Finally, I'd like to note that it is important that these innovation reforms for be, be expanded to allow crowdfunding and similar tools. They eliminate the restriction on general solicitation and they align the current provisions to expand the accredited investor rules. Ultimately, I believe these reforms will open up new channels for fundraising and allow businesses such as ours to succeed. Thank you and I look forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Co uh, Coaster. Uh, Ms. Williams. If you'll, if you'll touch the mic and turn it on. Um, and the uh, lights in front of you, I didn't point this out. Uh, red, yellow, and green, simple. Uh, at uh, one minute remaining, the yellow light will come on. Just means to wrap it up. You've got a minute to go. So uh, then the red light obviously still means stop. So okay. uh, thanks so much. Very good. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today and recognize all of you. Um, I'm glad that, uh, to hear that you're all recognizing the challenges that entrepreneurs have today in uh, sourcing capital, and these are very unique times for this. And the things that I'm going to talk today really are in contrast to what you just heard, because I'm a life sciences entrepreneur, and we are um, creating products um, that are medical products of which we need to train physicians to use as well as go through the research and development stages to get them to be um, useful, marketable tools for physicians. So I'm Lana Williams. I'm um, the CEO of Ridge Diagnostics. And Ridge is an early stage life science company with a mission to develop objective diagnostic and therapy management blood tests for neuropsychiatric disorders. And neuropsychiatric disorders are things like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and very importantly, depression. And our testing also um, impacts um, the medication selection and efficacy of those particular drugs used for those disorders. Um, this climate has created what I call a near-perfect storm for medical product innovation. Um, we are, as you know, most innovation comes from small companies in, in this country. And many of the jobs created um, are coming from small companies as well. So we're facing growing issues. I'm going to talk about Ridge, but uh, most medical companies that are at the stage of mine are facing these growing issues um, like the questionable um, hurdles at FDA. Some are known, some are not known. Um, very slow patent and trademark office that has prevented us from issuing a, a number of different studies and publishing our work because we, uh, it took two and a half years to get to first office action from the USPTO. So it slowed down our ability to move forward with our technology and our publications. And um, just an unknown path to reimbursement. Um, there are methods of getting reimbursement, at, but yet there's still some of it is unknown. But ultimately, the real crux is the limited sources of capital that are available to us to grow, to grow our companies. We can work through just about anything if we have the time and the money to be able to do that. So a little bit about Ridge and who we are and what we do. Um, all of us have been, um, all of us that are in, engaged in our board of directors, our senior management team, our serial entrepreneurs, we've been 
um, engaged in over 20 companies in the aggregate, startup or have founded or have managed uh, since the mid 80s. We've also had experience in large multinational companies. So we, we all agree we are facing a very unique time um, as it relates to our traditional means of funding. So what Ridge is doing, uh, as I mentioned, is providing these blood tests that will create objective diagnosis for depression. And that really is, is useful for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, serving the underserved that don't have access to specialty medical care um, as one. It will create a substantial number of jobs because this is a very, very large problem that we're trying to solve. The scope and the size of this is huge. 20 million adults suffer from depression in the U.S. and 6 million teens every year. That's about 1 in 10 Americans that are taking antidepressants today. So that's more than cancer, cardiovascular disease, and AIDS. So with that number of, um, of prescriptions being written, it is really truly a, a health care crisis. What we're finding is, in the last few years, antidepressants have been at least in the top three of all prescription drugs written in the United States, and the single most prescribed drug for people in the ages um, 18 to 44. Um, and I've read um, a number of different, different statistics, but one in particular that was just recently published that antidepressant use has increased by 400 percent between 2005 and 2008. And so with these numbers, we're looking at um, this broad uh, prescription rate, yet no objective tools to diagnose depression or to help to choose or select the therapy that might be the most effective. So our, our system is paying for treatment, whether it be the right treatment or not, um, but it's not paying for the early stages of accurate diagnosis and prevention. What we know is that 50 percent of all of the cases of depression are missed by primary care physicians, so it's not as easy as the pharmaceutical advertisements look like uh, to, to diagnose. And we know that 50 percent of those initial 200 plus million prescriptions written for antidepressants fail. So we have a significant problem in financing a company and a product where that can add objectivity to this, this large, costly um, situation that we're facing. So traditionally, um, venture capitalists has played a role in taking technologies like mine to, to the mass markets. We start out in the early phases of our companies being funded by angel investors, by friends and family ourselves by government grant programs like the S SBIR program, of which we received a National Science Foundation grant. We also have a study on teenagers being funded by, NI by NIH. So those grants are all very helpful, but they don't give us the enough uh, capital, if you will, to continue on with studies and to make our products commercially available and to be able to educate um, physicians in a way where they can start adopting new technologies. And diagnostics are very, very useful. However, they're not contributing yet to the high cost of care because although 60 to 70 percent of all decisions in healthcare are made by some kind of a diagnostic test, diagnostics only um, account for 2.3 percent of all national healthcare spending and only 1.6 percent of Medicare spending. So having more diagnostics on the market is, is going to bend the cost curve down by identifying the right patient, perhaps providing the right drug at the right time. It's not going to contribute to the overall higher cost of care. So lastly, I, I'd like to say that because we are without venture capital funds, it's very important for us to look to um, other means of capital. Um, certainly the crowdfunding initiative is one that could be very important for us. But we also um, have looked to large corporations because that's where our options have left us. And what that does for us is it, it, it reduces, um, it, it's, it comes at a high cost because it does affect autonomy and autonomy is where innovation comes from and it does affect job creation. Because as you know, most, um, most jobs are created by small companies. And I have just a couple of facts that I want to share with you that I received from the Kauffman Foundation related to this specifically. Um, this is in a, in a report they published in March um, that from, two from 1980 to 2005, firms less than five years old accounted for all net job growth in the U.S. So I'll end by saying that um, we think that these additional forms of capital that will replace venture capital for companies like ours 
will certainly help to change the curve related to slower no job growth, certainly bring rapid product products that are um, efficient and cost effective rapidly to, to care, especially to the underserved, and will help to bend the health care cost curve down as it relates to a disease area that affects one in ten Americans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams. Dr. Goldenberg. Uh, Chairman McHenry, uh, Ranking Member Quigley, and other distinguished House member, uh, it is a distinct honor and privilege uh, to testify before this committee. I will share with you my firsthand experience as an entrepreneur and to help you understand the challenges entrepreneur face today. For over 20 years, I've been a co-founder and executive of medical device biotech, and most recently a healthcare IT company located in San Diego. I'm here today to describe how difficult life is in the valley of death of healthcare startup companies. I will compare and contrast my experience funding startup companies 20 years ago to the difficulties I'm currently encountering. <coughs> now let's um, fast forward to the present. Um, the company I apologize. Uh, before I go to the present, I want to go back to the past. Apologize, confusing my pages. Uh, my goal here is to convince you of, of the need of Congress to act to create new opportunities for funding, which is vital to the advancement of medical technology, and uh, essentially create an unfettered access for all Americans to their own medical records. One of the companies I co-founded in the late 80s was Advanced Interventional System, or AIS. During the late 80s, the standard of care in cardiology for treating blocked coronary artery was to perform coronary artery bypass surgery. It's a medical procedure performed to relieve angina and reduce the risk of death from coronary artery disease. AIS was a part of new wave of company that pioneered coronary angioplasty. Angioplasty, as you may know, is the technique of widening a narrowed or obstructed blood vessel, typically occurring as a result of atherosclerosis. My co-founder and I launched AIS with just $3 million, Series A investment from VC. This inve in initial investment allowed us to hire a core team who developed a catheter prototype for animal study. There was also sufficient funding from this initial infusion of funds for our first submission to the FDA, requesting permission to initiate clinical trials in several hospitals. Today, angioplasty is the standard of care of cardiology. What was initiated and developed by many small startup companies developed into a multi-billion dollar industry. Angioplasty has saved lives, lowered healthcare costs, and created many thousands of jobs. This, sucks, this success would not have been possible without the initial investment from a group of VCs who are willing to come in at the startup stage with a long-term view to success. Unfortunately, this would not happen today. VCs have drifted to a later stage safe zone and shy away from the risk associated with the early stage of venture. Now let's fast forward to the present. The company that we are trying to currently fund, INRA, is a consumer-centered healthcare information and financial service portal. It is designed to operate as a key element of the Health Information Exchange, or HIE. HIE were created by the High Tech Act to serve the community, which will demonstrate future meaningful use of electronic medical records exchange among hospital and clinics and labs. EMRA's goal is to develop access for Americans to all their health-related information. As medical insurance premiums are increasing, a growing number of Americans are choosing high deductible plans to lower their medical insurance costs. Our mission is to act as a single service provider for consumers that aggregates information from provider and insurance. Our portal will enable the consumer to compare the cost of healthcare services at different providers. For example, if a patient needs a battery of blood tests, he or she 
could go into our portal to comparing the cost of getting the blood test at one lab versus an alternative. This is valuable to those with high deductible insurance plan and the average struggling American trying to make ends meet. Yet despite our innovative technology that can increase patient control of their health care, EMA faces funding difficulties in this economic climate. If Congress were to pass some of the bills being considered, we could start immediately hiring 15 people with a $3 million investment to start our operation. EMA is not alone. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA of 2009, has been producing large number of discovery and invention. This is great. However, in order for this discovery to be developed into devices, dr drugs, so and software, startup companies are needed to commercialize these discoveries and invention. Large companies are unwilling or incapable of handling high risk, high gain endeavors. Their complex hierarchy are unable <laughs> to move fast enough to provide intense concentration of effort needed to execute early stage projects. As you can see from my example, the severe shortage of capital funding has slowed the formation of startup companies to a trickle of what it has been. The result is that the American people are being hurt by the lack of creation of small companies, which produces technology that increase the quality of life while also producing high-paying jobs. Additionally, until ARA's discovery are moved into commercialization, the public is not fully benefiting from ARA. In closing, I encourage this committee and Congress to promptly act advanced legislation that will allow capital to flow to emerging company and startup. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg. And I thank the panel uh, uh, for their for their testimony, um, and uh, the the normal tradition is that the chairman asks questions first, and the ranking member, and we go back and forth from there. Um, I, it, this time, I'd like to, because of Mr. Quigley's schedule, I'd like to recognize him. At which point, I'll then ask questions, and we'll go through the normal path of Republicans and Democrats, and in, in that order. So, um, with that, Mr. Quigley is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. See that bipartisan working there. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you all make a compelling case for trying to find new ways to raise uh, venture capital, uh, capital to do all the job creation ideas that you've come forward with. Um, but this is this is different, and because you've gone through this, I'll start with you, Mr. Coaster. Uh, here we're talking about the potential for less sophisticated investors, and and at the same time, less regulation. So. We want this to work. I'm for this. If you're in our shoes, how do you try to protect those new investors in terms of the advice they might need? You know, you're used to more sophisticated investors, perhaps, who are doing more due diligence. How do we protect them? And you know, what are your thoughts? And then we'll go to the other witnesses. You know, the president's suggestion was a, a maximum of ten thousand dollars. Some have suggested as low as a maximum of $100. What are your thoughts having been through this? Sure. Thank you very much. It's a great question. Um, I think that the, the, key, the key lesson I think that we can take is, is what has happened with the, the information explosion that the Internet has brought. Uh, I think that even among sophisticated investors, we've actually seen an, a kind of a dissemination of information that allows investors to make better decisions among private companies today. So a great example is the company called AngelList, which actually assembles and aggregates startup companies who are looking for financing among accredited investors. That tool actually now allows you to take information such as the profile of the entrepreneurs that are being invested in, potent potentially their social network, blogging about them, and then also when one investor has met with that team and kind of validated that they're a, an, a sophisticated team or that they're an investment that they would make, that kind of information is able to be assimilated into the reputation of that startup company that then assists the other investors. So what I think really is happening is that by allowing kind of the dissemination of this information across a number of tools, I think that what you'll start to see is similar to 
reputation on the internet where now you can snap your finger and suddenly know if someone is, is qualified to take a loan or someone is qualified to essentially uh, you know, do work on your house for you. I think that same level of information will start to be assigned to startup companies so that we can take all this information that's being you know, across the there from a credit score of an entrepreneur all the way to his prior business successes, aggregate that information, and then give you a risk profile on that startup company. Um, and I think that you'll see that from the crowdfunding discussion you had. I think by allowing entrepreneurs entrepreneurs to essentially understand this sector, which would be the, 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 the kind of early stage crowdfunding, I think that you'll start to see some really interesting innovations that will allow reputation to help these, these businesses make those decisions. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Very good idea. Um, I agree. I think that there's um, a number of means that we can use to disclose information about our companies in a way where we can provide enough information that these reasonably formed investors can make a decision on their own. I mean, just like they're making a decision going to the stock market and buying something on the public market, they're making a decision based on on something that exists that they feel is worthwhile. So um, we do a lot of, um, we have 20 plus individual investors in our company now. They're accredited investors, but we provide them with a number of disclosure documents, um, including our financials. We provide um, bios on ourselves. We have uh, meetings with them. Some of them are over the internet by Skype or something other th like that. So I think that we can create some guardrails that are very helpful, and whether it's done on the internet or it's done in, which w it should be, I think we can securitize that in a way. But um, disclosure, I think, is really the key. I agree with my colleague. I just want to, I'd like to add that I, I do see a role for the SEC. If the SEC will simplify their language, for example, and make it more readable by the average person, I don't think the issue of sophistication will play as a role. To give you an example, I mean, we in the past had, and I've seen many sophisticated investor, you know, the VC or the angel, and they made mistakes, and the ratio of success has no change. So being sophisticated or being experienced not necessarily give you a chance to hire success. So I, I see the combination between simple rules from the SEC, which will be um, properly displayed on the website of the companies, and the company sharing information. This is all about sharing. I think the bigger issue is to force the company to share information to make sure they are not holding back because we have that issue even when you're private or public. You have to share information. If we share all the information, bad and good, I think that will eliminate some of the risk. Yeah, and, and very briefly, then, uh, the bad actors out there that can discourage investment by all, any thoughts on how, uh, who should play a role in helping investors deal with them? I, I do think the market will solve that. I ultimately think that because of the reputation of these these bad actor on, you know, investors and bad actor companies will be kind of disclosed, I do think that that solves a lot of it. I think that even today, uh, for example, when we were choosing which venture capitalists to go with, there's actually now tracking that will basically give the reputation of the, the venture capital fund and the venture capital partner itself. So when we were making decisions on who to take as an investor, we were able to look at that information on their reputation and decide which of them would be a bad addition to our team. Same, same with regard to when we're adding team members to our, our uh, company, we can look at background information as well as reputation um, on tools like LinkedIn to find out who those bad actors are. And I think that that, that information really does help, help provide Provide, kind of empower the uh, the individuals. Thank you for your accommodation, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member, and uh, I certainly appreciate the work he's done in Congress for disclosure, which is uh, to to actually the panel's point here. I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, it's a very simple question. So, Mr. Coaster, you're uh, well, actually, panelists, and y'all are basically serial entrepreneurs. Is that fair to assess you that way? So in raising capital, um, my legislation, which is this crowdfunding idea, um, allows, we originally designed it to allow folks to raise up to $5 million in capital from a large number of people. Uh, individuals are capped at 10% of their annual income or $10,000 um, to, to make sure that this is low dollar that folks aren't risking their 401k. In fact, they can't even access their 401k for this type of investment. Having said that, what is that marker uh, for, for raising capital that is 
would be helpful in your experience um, through your, your past experiences and what you're going through right now? What is that dollar amount of capital you need to raise for crowdfunding to, to be effective or helpful? Mr. Kosher, we'll start with you and we'll go across the panel. I think it's a great question. I think some of it depends on industry for sure. I mean, I do think that we being an internet mobile company, uh, there, we started out raising $1 million to get our product launched, uh, which was sufficient. But I do think to scale that business what requires more capital. I do think that my colleagues will discuss in the biotech and medical sector that a uh, $1 million is enough to basically, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to get you started maybe, but it's not enough to basically really do enough damage to understand, uh, you know, even if you have a product on your hand. So I think the $5 million number is is really a, a place where venture capitalists actually will start to invest more so. So I think that up to that $5 million is a, is right now, um, as, as was said, is a, is a lacking area in terms of investment. Pick a dollar amount. Tell me a dollar amount. Two, three million, four I think, million? I think at least three million. At least three million. All right. Ms. Williams? Well, obviously, um, the sector that I'm in, uh, we do require a little bit more capital than, than that. Um, however, we have raised at Ridge about four and a half million over the last couple of years through um, this angel money and the grants, which has got us to the point with our particular technology to be able to commercialize, at least on a limited basis, and we are receiving reimbursement. So, and we've had to work really hard for that four and a half million dollars because it's, we're getting it in a 50 or $100,000 increments. So I think the $5 million number is a very good number because until we get to a point where we can demonstrate some kind of a financeable milestone, which is, takes a lot of the risk factor out, um, we need to uh, continue to raise money. So $5 million to me is a really good starting point. Okay. Dr. Goldenberg? Uh, I would agree with uh, my colleague on the right. Uh, mm -hmm. We need at least five million dollars in the medical device biotech company. Biotech is even more than medical device, so five million dollars will be the minimum. If we do health IT, we we'll probably can do with three, but I would go with five. Okay, so the higher amount. And it, the concept of crowdfunding, would that replace angel investors in, in, your, uh, in your minds? Or would that basically take, take you to a, a capacity to get venture capital money or the other type of financing? Shall I respond? Sure. Um, in my opinion, I think it could be one or the other, frankly, and it depends on really the, the type of company, even whether it's in the healthcare sector. Um, for example, angel money is available. Um, so are the grants and the loans that get you to a certain point. Venture money today is not available. So I can use $5 million that will take me significantly into the marketplace where I can actually start generating my own capital and bootstrapping from there. Um, so really in this situation, I think it would replace venture capital. Um, if the markets continue to be as volatile as they are, I think, and we're seeing this now, angels are dropping off. They're holding on to their cash. Individuals are doing the same thing. So if that's the case, crowdfunding could certainly replace some of those typical accredited investors that um, may not want to participate in, in, at a higher level of investment. But for the folks that might be a part of the crowdfunding initiative, not buying stock on the open market because they don't want to be in the stock market. Do you think, do you think that crowdfunding could be a competition to bring down the cost of capital from angel investors? I think it certainly could be. Um, in all cases today, there's, there's a limited com competition, whether it's in the VC side or the angel side, that those of us are, that are raising money are giving up a significant amount of the company for very small amounts of money. Mr. Kosher? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the reality of what this does is it allows another avenue, which essentially creates more competition for these companies. I mean, I think what, what has been noticeable by this company, AngelList, that I think has kind of started to mass market the, uh, the angel investment space is by literally creating competition and disclosing information across these companies. You create better value for the companies that are going to succeed. You wind up increasing the, the amount that these companies are able to own. And I think that you just give companies a new angle to raise money that they may not otherwise have had. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. My time's expired. Mr. Coaster, I was on Zarley yesterday looking at what, uh, what's available in the Washington, D.C. market, who's seeking to buy and who's seeking to sell. And uh, I know there's a fellow, somebody in Adams Morgan who's looking for a gently used iPad 2. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if that was, uh, it wasn't me, but uh, I don't know if it's anybody in the room. But uh, anyway, th thanks so much, and I appreciate your testimony.
We'll now go back to the normal uh, process here. Mr. Meehan's recognized for five minutes, and we'll go to Mr. Yarmuth and uh, back and forth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for this panel, not only for the work that you're doing for allowing us to explore this issue, but what you're doing out there to try to create jobs. And I am uh, stuck on a couple of things which I would like you to tell me how we get out of. One, I'm struck by the fact that you're entrepreneurs, particularly in the life sciences. I have a lot of that in my area. And I hear frequently about the legacy of significant investment by big pharma or otherwise. And the truth of the matter is that there's a library of work that has been done, but it sits. And there's a lot of opportunity in there, and yet we can't acquire it and get it down to where entrepreneurs can actually take advantage of some ideas that they would be willing to move forward on. H how do we unleash more of that? And then the second question would be, um, how do we prevent, and maybe this, you're answering it by virtue of your testimony today, I'm struck by the fact that you keep saying that because of the VC market drying up and because of banks not doing loaning, you're being pulled right back into the same circumstance in which it's the big corporations you have to go back to, the very ones that are, that are too big and too slow to respond to a global marketplace. How do we unleash that $1.4 trillion that's sitting on corporate balance sheets, but do it in a way that can allow you to, 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 to put that money to work and reverse this tendency for the, you know, we, we keep going back because that's where the money is, but it slows down the entrepreneurial spirit. And so I'll, I'll take it in, uh, in order. And Mr. Coaster, as a recovering attorney, I'll let you <laughs> jump into that first. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the point that you raised about unlocking kind of potential science that's locked up various places really does come down to capital. I mean, what, when I was an attorney, I, one of the things that I did see is that, you know, you have to pay to license that technology from big pharma. So I do think that it all comes back to money. I mean, with, with startup companies... What can we do to require them to do more with, I guess these are proprietary things, but they've sometimes they've had government money that has invested in, 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 in that. And there seems to be, I am told, an awful lot of good ideas that, that are sitting on the shelf. Do you, do you agree with that? I think that actually part of it would come down to more education of these, of matching entrepreneurs with these businesses. A lot of times these assets that are locked up are un, unknown to the potential entrepreneurs and they are looking for ways to disclose it. So a, a smart, savvy entrepreneur who can figure out where these ideas and this technology is might be able to acquire it very cheaply. And I've seen that actually happen with a client named Kaneta that actually went around and formed a business simply to go out and extract unutilized resources from biotech companies and use those and turn those and commercialize those and sell them back. Ms. Williams, do you have some thoughts on the... Well, it's interesting because um, there are a lot of technologies that come out of big pharma that don't meet their, their um, revenue hurdles that get acquired by smaller companies, biopharma companies, and develop to a point where they are proof, have seen proof of principle and then they sell them back to pharmaceutical companies. And that's where venture capital has really facilitated that loop. So they've allowed for, pulled the capital, um, to allow for the entrepreneurs to further develop that technology and then sell it back to... Why ha you made a comment, why has venture capital money dried up? You would suspect that people see opportunity in this environment. Well, you would suspect that. What I've seen, and I have talked to over 100 venture capitalists in the last 18 months. So this is how I've spent my time. And what I hear from them is um, that their, their resources, their sources of capital have waned. And so they now have to reduce what they consider their, their risk profiles. So instead of invest investing in Series A capitalization for companies like mine, they're investing in later stage and what they perceive to be less risk type of companies. In fact, they've gone so far as to buy stock in the open market because it's been undervalued. So they have to protect their own investors. They have to protect their portfolio companies. There's very little liquidity in their portfolios now because of the lagging IPO market. So they're stuck. They can't make new, in new investments for the most part, or they're not willing to. So that's why it's dried up for early stage companies. And why this, your, your comment is a good one. There is a lot of pent up technology that's sitting there that could be very useful, but not useful enough that it's addressing the masses. Mm -hmm. And so without access to capital, basic 
you know, available monies, it's not going to come out of Big Pharma or any other corporation. Dr. Goldberg, do you have any thoughts? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to also clarify that one way, the way we start a company is not normally our ideas. We basically would go to a university in San Diego, you know, the big one, University of California, San Diego. That's where we get our idea, our discoveries. And we basically package it in a way and put in a business plan and do the planning. And then we go out and we talk to the VC. And so first point I, I want to make, and then I'll address the second question where you ask for a suggestion. We, I've seen the same thing, you know, talking to the VC, that they basically prefer to be later stage and, and for a simple reason, because they are afraid of the market. They, they invest in a small startup right now. They have to come uh, multiple times until they take it IPO. The IPO market doesn't exist right now. So for them to invest, they get stuck with an investment and they go to their limited partners and they say, I have no exit scenario for you. Mm -hmm. So when the IPO market... Because there's nobody coming behind that's making... No, that's because there's no public market for new companies. Public company or private company do not go public right now. And the, mar the, the, mar market the stock is market is structured in a way right now that there's no issues of uh, new companies. And that's so one, the, the one point into that is the hearing previously in March, May talked about second market, which was in uh, the secondary markets for that are the se semi-public market um, where you have certain disclosure opportunities. I think that is what is being addressed by the 500 shareholder limit being increased. Fundamentally, the hope with that is that it does allow more companies such as Azarly when it does advance in further stage that we can do a, a non-fully public sale, but we can sell to sophisticated investors in an open market that is uh, constrained. So it's not public entirely, but it is constrained in, in a way. And I think that's what that's addressing. I do think that that, that is an important step in this process and why I, I'm so supportive of the, the 200 shareholder limit because it does address that Ill illiquid market right now. So when they right. come, if, if you open the public market, the VC will come back. The VC are not bad people. It just, it's, it's, it's a risk versus gain. That's one point. The second point, uh, when, you, when you mentioned about the $1.3 trillion, one way of maybe unlocking that money is some tax break. If you go to a big pharma and if you tell them for every dollar they invest in a biotech with an idea or without an idea, they get a tax break of their taxable income or revenue, that, that may be looked as a good investment because what big pharma wants to do is to increase the pipeline of drugs. Right now, they don't invest that much in biotech because they would like to keep the cash for themselves for any days. But if you give them a tax break, you meaning the Congress, they may unlock their money. Chairman's time to us. expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yarmouth recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the panel for the testimony. It's a very interesting discussion. I have a background of having been involved in the startup of a number of ventures, some successful and some not so successful, as uh, that's the way the world works. And familiar with many of the uh, issues and challenges that you've faced. I'm, I'm intrigued by the whole notion of crowd uh, funding. I think it has enormous potential. I also think there are enormous opportunities for mischief in, in, in this area. As we know, that any time we create some kind of new business technique, there are those out there who <coughs> want to take advantage of it for purposes other than which it was intended. So I, I am concerned about the regulation. Uh, the chairman asked about what kind of monetary limit you would think would be appropriate. If we were to lift the 499 limit on number of investors, do you have any sense of what an, a, a manageable amount would be and something that would still retain some kind of uh, uh, element of security? Just a notion that we might... I think the, the current proposal that has a broad base of 2,000 and it excludes a certain individuals such as accredited investors and employees does allow you to, to solicit from a broad enough pool. I mean, I, I think that fundamentally it's one of those, you know, as, a, as executives of companies, 2,000 shareholders is something I can't fathom to manage. <laughs> However, I do think that when, if, the, if the decision is to close the company or to have 2,000 shareholders, and I believe in the idea that I do, I would absolutely take 2,000 shareholders and not sleep um, because I do think it's one of those things that ultimately, uh, you know, entrepreneurs like us believe in our vision so much so that we're willing to do what it takes. And if that means manage 2,000 shareholders, then 
That's what we do. Right. Um, I think uh, Ms. Williams mentioned the issue of, of how much the equity is given up in some of these deals, particularly with venture capital, and that's always going to be an equation. If you had your absolute ideal situation for getting money any way you could get it, what way would be preferable? Would it be selling equity? Would it just be having access to affordable loans? Um, how, what would be your preference? I think I would probably look to a variety of different sources. I think um, selling equity would, would be one. Um, you look for that, not just for money, but you look for it for expertise, for assistance with um, other um, maybe areas of business. So to me, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I think we could be able to, I'd like to see that happen in a way where you're not giving up the majority share of your company to be, to be able to, to gain expertise. Mm -hmm. Um, I think loans would be fantastic. Those are pretty much un unavailable to us today. Because the cost um, of equity right now, uh, the cost of borrowing money, if you could get it, interest rates now are far lower than correct. the equity, the cost of the equity you'd have to give up. Which leads me to the next point. Uh, I have a piece of legislation that uh, I've introduced that would actually direct the SBA to lend money to small businesses on the same basis that we're l lending it to large banks, in other words, free. And the idea that if you have a certain track record that why not use government funds to make those kind of loans. The SBA doesn't want to do that, and I must confess, but that's why the legislation actually directs them to. Is this some kind of a program that you think might be helpful in, in your situations where the, you know, the SBA could, if you, probably not in a $2 million or $5 million range, but in a half million dollars or so that you could go and get very low income financing? Let me share my experience. I actually went to the SBA. Um, we got so desperate about six months ago, went to the SBA and said, look, we started a company right here in San Diego. I talked with the head of the SBA in San Diego, explained the situation. And he said, well, you need to go to a bank. And we went to the banks and the bank said something very simple. What is the collateral you're going to bring me? Sure. How about your house? That's not the business we are in. So as a startup company, medical device, or a health IT, I cannot put my house. So in other words, the, the, the availability of free money, when I say free money, I mean the availability of, of inexpensive, money. inexpensive money in the form of a loan, it won't help me that much. Would not help you. Will not. Not to the type of company we are. If there's some way of well, mechanism, because you, you, you can't afford to pay it back, if you, because if we have no collateral, we cannot work. pay it back. Right. You know, all the yeah. company we are dealing, we we're not going to have revenue for three to five years, or we will have, but it will not be where we can pay back our loan. So we will go into a default, in which you don't want to go mm -hmm. that through. One quick question, because you talked about research and and a lot of other things that are things that are. Funding for which is threatened right now because of our um, current financial situation as a nation. Uh, do you think it's advisable at this point in our future to cut funding for things like scientific and medical research and uh, education and many of the other things that would help support either directly or indirectly the activities you're in? Uh, I'll jump I would have in. Ten with trained uh, ten trained engineers right now. If I could find uh, find that quality of them, so I do think that we're sh there's a shortage of engineers for the and scientists for the technology industries yeah. we're in. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the vice chair, uh, Mr. Genta from New Hampshire, is, uh, New Hampshire is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow very briefly on the SBA. I think the SBA has a, a certain role to play in in very very small businesses. I'm not sure that the SBA is in properly incentivized uh, to assist the, the kind of companies that you are looking to to build, to grow, and to expand. Um, so I, I think the clearer way to do this is to give you greater flexibility and greater opportunities to identify your own private capital. Um, there's a couple things I want to talk, Ms. Williams, to you about. You mentioned in your testimony uh, a little bit about uh, autonomy issues when getting dollars from larger companies. Can you first just expand on that a little bit? Sure. Depending on um, what the what the transaction looks like, it could be something as uh, limited as a licensing agreement or a strategic partnership. 
Today, um, to, to facilitate that, the larger companies are taking equity in the company. They're not just paying a licensing fee like they had in the past, where you're left autonomous. They're actually taking equity in the company, so they have some control over what it is that you're doing. But it's gone so far for the most part, and they're so heavy-handed, because they can be, that um, they're basically acquiring the company. And when that happens, they absorb the company into their own infrastructure. And what that does then is it reduces the opportunity for job creation that would otherwise be realized by in the small company hiring and growing. So it takes away the autonomy as it relates to innovation because for the most part they're not willing to take risks and invest money in, in new ideas. And it, and it affects that whole job creation aspect as well. So that's what I was referring to. In my home state of New Hampshire, uh, about 75, 80% of our economy is generated by a small business owner. Uh, that's defined as 500 employees or less. In New Hampshire, it's even smaller. Uh -huh. uh, and it is the, the lifeline and the lifeblood of our local economy. We're trying to attract more companies like yours into the southern tier of New Hampshire, into the seacoast of New Hampshire. And one of the things that I continue to hear is, again, the lack of access to capital, the lack of... Um, uh, the, the, the lack of, of choices. You mentioned, or I, I think someone on the panel mentioned, uh, we have a decline in the number of IPOs in this country and on mm -hmm. uh, the New York Stock Exchange. We have a decline in VC uh, investment. We have a decline also in angel investment. There is a lot here that is shrinking in terms of access. Mm -hmm. Some of that is actually going overseas, and those companies are being created overseas, and those jobs are be being created overseas. And in your industry, I think we're talking, or probably all three of your companies, you're talking at minimum of a, of a $60,000 job plus. I mean, these are high paying, high quality uh, jobs that we could be creating right here in America if the access to capital issue is addressed. Mm -hmm. So there's two or three components. Number one, I think the, the chairman's bill makes a lot of sense at a $5 million instead of a $1 million, which is what the president is looking for. Uh, I think we have to have the proper level of, of company disclosure so uh, individuals can do their own research. I tend to believe in, in, in the individual American that they can make the right decision uh, so long as the bad actors are uh, minimized by access to information. That makes sense to me. And allowing an individual to invest in your company uh, provides you greater access. But the second component I want to ask about, uh, and you touched on it a little bit, is um, uh, raising funds by issuing equity and, and, how, and how that gives you the ability to defer payments. And you talked a little bit about it. If you go get a loan from the SBA and, and your, your, market, your business plan suggests that you're not going to be uh, making money until three to five years out, you've already eliminated that option. But, but equity selling equity provides you that greater opportunity, does it not? That is correct. Uh, one way to look at equity, the way I describe it is, is our own way of, sh of uh, printing money. Um, we basically give a piece of the company for getting money in, but that's some form of IOU for the future, that we will develop it, have the revenue, and then they will make much more. And this is exactly what uh, spurs on the entrepreneurship, the innovation, Correct. And, and the ability to create an idea and bring it to market. And that's what we want to see happening in our country with a 9.1% unemployment rate. This is a critical component. The other component um, that, that I'm very concerned about is the, the, the ban on general solicitation. Mr. Coaster, if you can talk a little bit about that, um, how that's affected uh, your company and what that would do uh, if we lifted it, how how you could get uh, that that capital quicker, and how you could get job creation quicker as a result? Sure, I think that the the example, you know, the the, the real challenge is is that a an, an entrepreneur entrepreneur can't uh, can't use all the tools that they can to generate business to generate investment. So, for example, if you have a presence on social media, or if you write a book and you in that book, uh, you know, say that you're looking seeking funding, you could actually be sanctioned by the SEC. I think that what it does is it puts limits that that are not necessarily, uh, you know, there's ways around those limits. So it's it's a bit more of a kind of uh, you know form over substance. I, I really think that what it does is it allows people to just have that open disclosure of information, and we don't wind up having back channel discussions, kind of cloak secrecy. I, I think what it does is it allows puts a puts an open target on things and for us maybe our financing process could have been shortened from a nine month process down to you know a couple month process if we could have just opened it up there and made it an open dialogue okay thank you all very much i yield back uh, we will begin a second round if that's okay with the Thanks. panel um, 
We, uh, uh, there are a few other things I, w I just wanted to get your thoughts on in, in, in particular. Um, so we have a 500 shareholder cap. And this was raised a little earlier, uh, but I want to get your feedback on this. So um, it appears right now that um, uh, allowing unlimited number of accredited investors to invest in your company is no longer legislatively attainable at this moment, mm -hmm. um, at least in the short run. Um, so the cap will likely remain at, at 500 uh, for some some you know for the remainder of this Congress unless the SEC acts. So uh, how do you feel about uh, this turn of events? How, how do you feel about that limitation? Um, and what impact do you think that would have if we raise that cap? on your ability to raise capital and what that would mean for jobs and growth and uh, innovation. And Mr. Coaster, we'll begin with you and go across the panel if that's okay. Sure. I, th I think that, um, the, the challenge is, is that I think the crowdfunding legislation that, you, that you, um, you, you've introduced, I think there becomes a waterfall effect. Essentially, if, with, by opening up crowdfunding, which may allow me as a company to add 100 shareholders, uh, suddenly I've now, uh, I've only got 400 left. And I think that what we start doing is we open it up to a brighter, broader audience, but then we also basically keep the, the, the cap on that audience tight. And I think that, that, that those two need to be thought of as orchestrated together. Because I do think when you open up the shareholder base early in the company's life cycle, uh, it winds up limiting what you can do later on down the road. So essentially, for me as a business where I'd add 200 crowdsourced investors in my company, down the road it would make it challenging for me to use a tool like Second Market or to use a tool that would allow me to not cap, go over that cap and, and raise funds in that way. So I do think that it's a challenge to have those two, uh, you know, not move in tandem. Well, uh, to, just to be clear on this, um, my crowdfunding legislation has no cap. Mm. And, and so that is, that is the beauty of it, is that we carve out a uh, it's a you know, relatively small amount of capital you can raise, but it's from an infinite number of people. Now, the individuals themselves are capped what they can invest annually, um, and that was due to a lot of concern on, on fraud, uh, you know, to, to make sure that somebody doesn't bet their life savings on something. Um, you know, they, don't, they don't put up uh, a million dollars on a million, dollar crowd, million and a half dollar crowdfunding uh, raising venture uh, without having a clue. I mean, so th there is sort of this concern of fraud, investor protection, and all that. So, so you wouldn't be subject to that. Okay. Th that is, uh, I think, one of the positives of it. But to this larger question about, um, we basically have a 500 shareholder cap, which includes accredited investors, it includes um, connected people, employees, and, it, um, and those that are close relationship uh, individuals. So it's, it's a pretty limited group um, to remove employees from that calculation. It's helpful. Uh, and if you disagree, please chime in. But to remove accredited investors, would that be helpful? Would that be a positive that, so you could have even pushing up to a thousand or, uh, you know, all that? Yes. And I understand you, you mentioned you, you'd much rather not have to deal with a thousand individuals. I get that. I'm the youngest of five kids. Just it's, <laughs> it'd be easier to have uh, a brother and a sister, not two brothers and two sisters, especially when they're bigger than you. Um, so part of it is is sort of difficult to deal with and contend with. Um, do you think that would be helpful to remove that five that uh, accredited investor number from that 500 shareholder cap? And would that help, Ms. Williams? I think it would. Um, they kind of have separated themselves out anyway, right? So there's a, they're manageable as it is. But you think about, um, you know, a thousand investors. And to me, I think there might be a way to, you know, create the mutual fund sort of concept with those people so that it doesn't mean that me or my CFO are managing a thousand people. It means that I'm, in, I'm managing a um, institutional vehicle that, or a investment vehicle mm -hmm. of one or three or five that might have 100 or 150 people in it. And that way they can kind of form their own sort of, um, I guess, um, opinions. Mm -hmm. And that would come to me in the form of five opinions instead of 500 opinions. So I think there's ways of doing that that makes it manageable for the entrepreneur. Okay. Okay. Dr. Goldberg? Uh, 
If I understand you correct, um, you want to move the accredited investors out of the, the one available to invest. Uh, uh, rather than limit it to 500 shareholders, um, to, to remove that accredited investor from that count. So they will or to raise the cap. Will I mean, they be allowed to invest in this crowdfunding? Yes, they, well, uh, two separate issues, two separate issues. Crowdfunding is available to uh, every individual. It's okay. just capped on uh, the percentage that they can invest of their income. The question with accredited investors and the 500 shareholder cap is a separate question. Um, do you think it would be helpful to raise that number? Um, and additionally, would it be helpful to remove accredited investors from that count of individuals? Um, I think the way I look at this crowdfunding is it's another form of IPO because you're going to have a large number of investors right now. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a company, you know, I've been in the, you know, taking a private company going public. And once you get used to it, it's manageable. So the crowdfunding to me is another form of a public offering without really calling it a public offering. So whether they give us the money now or later, we will manage the same with the risk and the reporting and everything, and the disclosure. So I, the, as I would agree with your point is the more you have, the better. Okay. So, uh, you know, limiting uh, the choices f for uh, raising capital, whether that's the equity or whether it's uh, giving away equity or um, getting a loan um, or bootstrapping it. I mean, you know, th th there's a cost to that. So r widening the array of capital choices for you as an innovator and entrepreneur, that lowers the cost, potentially. 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 And so it gives you opportunities, um, more opportunities. So, uh, you know, with that, there, there, I've got too many questions for you to, for, for time, and I know your time is 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 uh, limited but Ms. Williams you said something very interesting and in preparation for this hearing uh, this you, you brought this up which was um, right now you're going to the big corporations sort of fortune 500 companies or fortune 1000 or Correct. and getting and getting capital from them mm -hmm. What is the cost? Describe to me the, the, the cost, the limitations, what that means, right? What does that mean beyond your company? What does it mean to your ability to grow jobs, to the ability of the economy to start moving again? What, you know, what, what is sort of this micro, m macro uh, view of, of what this means? Well, it can mean good and bad, but to me, as it relates to uh, job creation to start with, I think it's not going to help to create more jobs for the most part. Because like I was saying earlier, small companies um, really have the ability to, to create jobs where larger companies don't prove to do that. And with a, t a company like mine, they'll absorb my company into theirs. And so I won't be out hiring and growing. And so therefore job creation is going to be flat as it relates to me specifically. Whereas I know I could create 300 jobs with under $10 million of funding in just a few years, just at Ridge alone, based on our forecasting. So to me, that's a, you know, it's, it's not the alternative that I wanted to take, but it's the only choice I have right now. So they will take a percentage of the company, frankly, we're negotiating that right now, and what that's going to be, and they're going to control the single largest market because they'll have licensing rights into the single largest um, area of use for this particular blood test. So it, I am not going to have access to that. My shareholders will have a um, royalty revenue uh, that will contribute to their value, um, but not the full value of, of product sales. So it's, it's what we're, uh, you know, it's the balance that we, have to, that we have to choose. Will they, typically their larger companies are very risk adverse. I mean, they have their, you know, they have their own array of things that they have to manage, and I appreciate that. Um, so therefore, they're going to be less likely to um, accelerate innovation. They don't want to have their um, earnings per share reduced for any reason, right, especially mm -hmm. right now and they want to make sure that management is retaining their positions so they're not going to make any mistakes 
they're going to kind of toe the line. So I think it's going to really create a flat environment and a job reduction uh, as it relates to potential new jobs. Okay. So uh, this is a, 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 another question to sort of this, um, this element. When we're talking about uh, capital markets, regulations coming from Washington, whether it's SEC or the laws that we've actively passed in this Congress. Can you touch on what is limiting your ability to grow and create jobs? You know, get, tell, tell me the limitations, the barriers, and um, the problems. I mean, state the problem or a, a regulatory problem or law that, that it impedes your ability to grow and create jobs. I think a lot of it has come down to Sarbanes-Oxley. I think that that has slowed the ability of private companies to, to go public. And, and I think what that's done is it's, it's kind of created a backlog within the entire cycle. So I think what we've done is we've locked up the innovation capital exchange by having no clear exit valve for companies once they hit a certain size. A company such as Facebook or a company such as, uh, such as Twitter should have in other days gone public by now. However, I think that due to the fact that there's this increased burden on being a public company, you're seeing those companies hold back longer than they would have before. And the backwards effect of that are is that the shareholders of Facebook are unable, the venture capitalists who basically invested in them early are unable to get that capital back so they can reinvest in the next wave of companies. So I think that that winds up creating a backlog of problems where you wind up not having the flow of that capital, uh, the innovation capital, I like to call it, exchanged back. So essentially what, what we need to really find is more ways to basically spur companies to be able to go public. And I think that there, there's multiple ways to do it. One is the public markets themselves. The second one is companies like, like Second Market and similar type of exchanges like that that do allow liquidity. So I think that the liquidity, uh, the rules that limit liquidity of companies are, are really where I think we see some backlog. Ms. Williams? Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I, I can't put my finger on any other specific things other than perhaps taxation, which obviously is not something that affects us today. But, um, you know, I, I live in the state of California, but um, our laboratory and our research is all done in North Carolina. And um, thank you. A, yes, um, <laughs> we're trying to create jobs there. <laughs> um, and there's a significantly different cost doing business in California than there is in North Carolina um, as it relates to taxes and other things. So I think um, you know, that, is, that will, will be a driving factor and probably is for a number of companies where they decide they're going to um, incorporate and where they're going to um, develop their companies. Okay. Dr. Uh, Goldenberg? Yeah. And we talked about raising funds, but uh, other obstacle is, for instance, uh, dealing with, for in our case, with the human health and services. Um, there is ONC, the Office of National Coordinator. Um, and we try to talk to them and both about incorporating our system in their program, the HIE, the Health Information Exchange, and they kind of ignored us. And they like to deal with large hospital community uh, project, but they sh shy and not that interested in talking to a small company. So um, it would be nice to have them on board and also recognize the role that we'll play in, in commercializing all this. Okay. Yeah, uh, finally, if you had just uh, one thing you wanted to say about job creation, just here's your moment. Go for it. Mr. Coaster? Give us a chance and we'll create a lot of jobs. Yeah, I agree. And I think we should go back to talking about this loan opportunity because the state of North Carolina, the North Carolina Biotechnology mm -hmm. Association, has funded Ridge in the tune of over $500,000 over several years to be able to do our research and have our laboratory in that area. And I think that is a way, loans, whether they're securitized with some kind of a collateral or not, which is what has happened in, in the state of North Carolina in that particular area, because they're offering entrepreneurs the opportunity, is a really terrific way to get jobs started. Um, so I think we need to go back and think about how to construct loans, whether it be through SBA or others, where we're not giving up capital or equity um, to be able to create jobs. Dr. Goldenberg? I think creating job is a great uh, effort, but it's also what we are doing also creating high paying job. And I think that's very important. Many people forget about that. And I think that's, we should you recognize it. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. P Maloney from New York is, uh, is back uh, from uh, bouncing around. Uh, yes. 
Um, and uh, before I recognize uh, Ms. Bologna, I, I want to I want to thank uh, my colleague for working diligently on uh, improving the legislation that I filed and working with me to uh, to amend it and uh, working in a very collaborative way to I think uh, bring a, a bill that. Uh, has bipartisan support and allays a lot of the concerns about about fraud and uh, the structure uh, that you worked with us on creating. I think it will be very beneficial, and I thank I thank my colleague. Well, I, well, I thank you, and uh, it will be on the floor tomorrow. Absolutely, and I'll be there supporting it uh, with you. And I want to credit uh, the chairman's leadership uh, for being open to suggestions and and working with us in a, a very creative way to make a good bill a better bill. And uh, people say this Congress can't work together. Well, this is one example uh, where we're working together to help get uh, access to the markets up there and to help uh, smaller companies move forward and to remove the barriers, in this case on his legislation, on what's called crowdfunding. Uh, which is the aim of the chairman's legislation. And it's uh, also, I might add, a component of President Obama's Americans Job Act. Uh, the president is likewise supporting his legislation. In fact, uh, the president's uh, uh, legislation includes several provisions to increase the amount of capital small or startup businesses can access, retain, and put to good use. Uh, and while crowdfunding would likely be helpful, for some startups, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists, wouldn't you agree that crowdfunding and related or similar changes to securities law are not the only tools that we can have at our disposal to encourage uh, uh, the startup of businesses and small businesses moving forward? Uh, for example, I'd like to give to you for your comment uh, some of the ideas that are put forward in the American Jobs Act, which we would like to get to the floor also for a vote, and I hope uh, the chairman can help us move that legislation to the floor for the vote. And for example, the American Jobs Act plan, uh, we have proposed cutting in half uh, small business employer and employee payroll taxes. So this would put money right back into workers and, and employers' hands. Um, another provision is temporar temporarily eliminating employer payroll taxes for small businesses that create jobs or give raises for existing workers above the prior year's wages and eliminating the payroll tax if that is accomplished. Extending an immediate 100 percent expensing write-off into 2012 to encourage businesses to invest in machinery and other new equipment. Extending tax credits for businesses that hire workers who have been unemployed for at least six months. Raising the cap on many public offerings of small uh, firms from five million to 50 million. And this is actually on the floor uh, tomorrow too and is a bill that likewise we have worked together on in a very positive way, so that will be moving forward. And increasing skills-based training for youths and adults. So I would just uh, like to ask all the witnesses uh, if you would comment on, on uh, these policies uh, that you, and whether or not you think they would be helpful to, to new or small businesses. And if you have another idea that you think could help our get economy moving, uh, uh, help uh, businesses grow and expand and hire more people. So I'd, I'd like to start, talk with, uh, start with uh, Mr. Custer and go down the line, Ms. Williams and Dr. Goldenberger. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's great to see all the support of small businesses and, and early stage companies because I do think that, that our goal, all of our goal, is to grow into those large mature businesses that can, can create thousands and thousands of jobs. So, so I think across the board, any provisions that allow uh, an, an increased access to capital um, an increased ability to attract and retain employees and an ability to basically grow our business free of restrictions and limitations are helpful across the board. Uh, I also think that one of the points that, that all of us will face too is in the technology sector is improvements to immigration um, will be an important thing for us to be able to attract talent from around the world. I do think that's one of the things that the United States has an incredible advantage at doing. Um, so I do think that's another piece of long-term sustainability is immigration reform. May I uh, comment to that? Um, and I'd like to bring it to the chairman's attention. I do have a piece of, of legislation in called the Startup Business Visa Application. And this would speed up visas 
for people coming to America that are sponsored by other American businessmen who are willing to invest in their startup idea. And the money can either come from the immigrant or it can come from the, uh, it, or it can come from an American businessman and help move that forward. As the chairman and the panelists know, we have a program for uh, investment where if an entrepreneur wants to come to this country and invest a million dollars, then their visas are speed, they, they, there is a speed up process to help them come and invest in a business that has been acknowledged and uh, supported by American business. And they're, they're not using all those visas. So it wouldn't be new visas. It would be taking the visas that already exist and allowing them to come with capital. I, I would like um, to request additional time to put forward another idea that I think is critically important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, if every, <laughs> this is great. This is a bipartisan uh, cooperation here. Um, so many businesses have been started by really very few people, one or two people, with incredibly little capital. If you look at the story of Steve Jobs, he started in his garage with one friend and a hundred dollars. So a lot of businesses in America, in fact most of them, have started with an idea and an entrepreneur trying to move forward. So I, I would like uh, this committee uh, to look at, at uh, loans, microloans, the small loans that are given out uh, to one or two individuals in small amounts. This country has supported microloans in foreign countries in many ways to help their economy. But I think it would be an excellent way where we could partner with the private sector to create uh, a microloan area that could respond to some of these young people that have a fine education, but the jobs are not there for them. Now let's give them a helping hand to move up forward. So I would specifically like to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Goldenberg and uh, Ms. Williams well, to respond to yield on microloans. That, on the note of microloans? Yes. I, um, there are two interesting websites in, in doing all the research we did for uh, crowdfunding uh, that are available, uh, prosper.com and uh, Kickstarter. I mean, I, did, I think Mr. Koster, you, you, uh, Mr. Koster mentioned that, uh, but both, uh, both these websites do peer-to-peer -peer micro lending and it's absolutely fascinating the, the success they have. Um, and earlier, uh, when, when my colleague uh, had to step to the other hearing, uh, Mr. Koster uh, mentioned uh, that, in essence, you establish a reputation as an entrepreneur. And that reputation will enable your investors to assess, a, create a risk profile. Um, it, Prosper is, is doing that. Uh, and, it, and it's fascinating to, to watch this. It, it's, it, it's in essence, um, you know, Amazon uh, put, allowed individuals to write negative reviews about a book. And people said, well, that's crazy. You're trying to sell books. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, he says, well, I want people to come back and buy another book. That's why. Likewise, eBay. You know, uh, you, you have individuals that exchange uh, goods on eBay every day, mm -hmm. and they're wonderful products, and if you, if you send the person a bad product, you're done. You, you're not going to be able to you know, sell your stuff on eBay anymore. And likewise, uh, you know, um, individuals, and, you know, you can do one-on-one -on -one individual fraud, but on the Internet, it makes it very difficult because you establish a reputation, <laughs> which prevents you from... Uh, getting away with it more than once, uh, or you know, a limited number of times, which is wonderful. And I, I and I just yield back to. Well, I, I thank the gentleman uh, for his uh, insight here, and and I'd re like to uh, request a hearing on Kickstarter and Prosper.com, and and let's take a look at these uh, smaller startups and the new technologies. I, I commend you for moving forward with the crowdfunding. I, I think it's an exciting idea, and accepting. Uh, uh, democratic amendments to really uh, protect investors more and put more transparency out there. But I, I think that, that there's a lot of uh, new ideas that are out there with this new economy and with this high-tech economy and that we should be looking at them. And, and I, I think that the microloans are particularly um, uh, been very successful, particularly with women starting small cottage businesses. But I also think the small young men and women who are out of work and highly educated 
would be uh, very good prospects to to uh, have an idea and try to start working on it and give them a little support to do it. So I'd like to ask Dr. Goldenberger if he could uh, respond to microloans and specifically the idea of a uh, public-private match. Uh, we are all in this economy together. We are all in this country together. And I, I'd like an opportunity for successful businesses to really uh, give back to the young men and women who want to follow in their footsteps of, of going forward with new products, innovation, new ideas. I think microloaning is, is a great idea and I would encourage you to pursue it. Um, for a simple reason, it provides new money. Uh, American ingenuity is everywhere, every field, not just our field, medical technology or health IT. You can see it everywhere you go these days that there's a small uh, business or a small operator that started. So if you can provide, I don't know exactly what's the number for my client, but ten, twenty-five thousand dollars mm -hmm. I think that will be a big step for them to start working, producing something. So what about a public-private match? What about involving the public sector? What is your feeling on that? Voluntarily. I think, if, again, I'm looking at it from the point of generating new funding. If you can do that matching and provide more services or more consulting that will help to start a new business, I think that will be great. Great. And uh, Ms. Williams? Yes, I agree. I think micro-lending is a very valuable um, way to generate additional new businesses. I'm, I've um, actually participated in it um, outside the U.S. in a very small way. So we're talking about... Excuse me, I have to run to another hearing. I, I have to give back my time. I look okay. forward to working with you. Okay, I've got to run. Uh, okay. you, you may finish answering I affirm, <laughs> affirm micro-lending. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. And, and this is actually, you know... Um, this is for the record, and we're actually uh, being streamed online. So uh, this is actually helpful to establish this record because you're creating jobs. You know, it, we in Congress, we may have previously been creating jobs um, in our you know, previous work, but we're trying to create the, uh, the regulatory framework that will frees you up and enables you to, to be creative. Mr. Dr. Goldenberg, do you, wanna, do you have any comments to... My colleagues' questions or Mr. Coaster? Okay. Um, the, the final question I have for the for the whole panel, because it is interesting. Of a, 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 you know, a, the, the online guy, um, the uh, woman who does biotech, and the gentleman who does a different form of bi biotech, which is it's great to have this cross section. But do you think that the lack of capital in the current market we're in? Do you think it affects certain industries more than others, and what does that mean? I'll start this time. Sure. Um, as I'm looking at the panel, one of the things that struck me is that we are operating a different time scale. In my world, it, before and now, we're talking about three to five years. Um, my gentleman here, my colleague, um, he, he operates on six months. Last time, you 24 start? hours. <laughs> 24 <laughs> hours. Uh, so we are much slower, and it, it, we need to invest now in order to see the fruit in three to five years. Yeah. So what we are here asking the, co the Congress is to keep that in mind, too, that a very large part of the American economy, I think actually the largest part of the Am American economy is the drugs, devices, it's, it's, I think it's approaching uh, $100 billion or even more in sale per year. So whatever you decide today will have a major impact. And I want to keep in mind that the, si the time to get there is not the six months or something. That's very important. Over the horizon. Absolutely. Over the horizon. In other words, we are operating either with little revenue or have revenue, but not necessarily profitable. So that's something to keep in mind. Sure. Ms. Williams? Um, yes, I think we can bifurcate that to a certain degree by saying what we do from a development and a research standpoint and creating 
these new uh, medical products takes more time. But the dissemination of information about those products, once they've been proven, can go as quickly with the tools um, that are being developed in the tech sector. So we can reduce the time that we make these, these um, products available, and we can educate physicians online through Medscape and other ways of continuing medical education where it doesn't require some costly sales rep knocking on their door. So I think, um, I think it's going to take us more time because we have to, to do that credible research and make sure that we are creating a safe and efficacious product, but we can disseminate that information much more quickly through and, and essentially catch up, if you will, from that standpoint with uh, the technology sector. Okay. D Mr. Kosher, in terms of the lack of capital, does it affect one industry more so than others? For instance, in, in tech, I mean, there's this perhaps emphasis on apps, this sort of sexy, cool apps. The, the newest, greatest thing is capital flowing, uh, whether it's Ashton Kutcher or whatever, uh, putting a lot of money in, uh, in, in those, but less so at this uh, sort of uh, o you're actually in a more over the horizon uh, perspective, rather than an app that you know you have you know very short turn time. You're actually building something that takes a little more time, even though it's still you know <laughs> very very brief from traditional thoughts. Yes, I think that's it's a it's a very good point. I mean, our ultimate goal of Zarly is to create a, a local commerce, local jobs, and I think that's where we see we've seen almost eight million of truly local American community-based jobs and requests being generated from our tool. So while it is relatively fast, I think that we also see a long time horizon and hopefully kind of spurring American jobs and hopefully that keeping that $8 million that may have never otherwise existed um, in these kind of, you know, communities. So I do think, you know, fundamentally, I think that it is, you know, incumbent on, you know, government, corporations, and the, the populace to to support you know, innovation, I do think that the biotech and health sector does have a longer horizon at things, and I do think that access to capital may sometimes slow those, uh, those, those innovations that may not have mass market adoption. I mean, there's, there's technologies that may, may meet a niche need of a healthcare need that is out there, whereas um, that, that may not receive the funding because the venture capital space isn't quite as uh, you know, willing to, to, to bet on a $500 million company versus a $5 billion company. So I think th that is one of the challenges right there, is helping those companies. And, and I also think the other thing that's interesting about my industry is that I think we benefit from the investment the U.S. government made in, um, you know, telecom, in, made in the internet and those type of things. I think that, you know, those investments that were made in infrastructure wind up allowing us to launch a business in a weekend. I mean, were it not for the ability to, to get the, the, the internet on your phone that comes from investments made by the government and others, I don't think that our ability to launch this company would exist. So I do think that those kind of investments do have a huge impact on our ability to launch technology businesses. And I think those type of investments in things like genomics and research and supercomputers and those type of things that can speed up the, the healthcare and biotech sectors are crucial. Well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, obviously, I mean, today is, is largely focused on capital formation um, and uh, regulatory impediments on capital formation, but there are so many other issues we have to face. Um, and uh, to uh, the testimony today, um, fascinating to, to hear, you know, no matter what we do to spur more capital formation, businesses still have the challenge, and they can still fail. Uh, with a great idea, you can still fail. And the challenging uh, environment today of getting consumers to actually use your product still remains, or getting your product to the market still remains. Um, but we also need to make sure that that uh, we're in a fruitful space for that innovation to occur, occur and that the, the regulatory impediments that we can remove and relieve small businesses of, that we do, that we actually take that on. But we clearly have to have infrastructure. We clearly have to have um, educational resources and the right investments in those constructs so that that can take place. We still are you know, the, the largest economy on earth. We still have wonderful opportunities and wonderful resources, even though we're going through very challenging times right now. And the fact remains that we can still get back to those good days of real strong real and strong economic growth and job creation and get this unemployment rate uh, down um, and, and give people choices and opportunities. 
but thank you so much for testifying today, in particular about capital formation, and thank you for providing this committee and this Congress uh, your insight and um, experience. We certainly appreciate that. And with that, uh, the committee is adjourned.